Here we're going to talk about pharmacokinetics for the USMLE Step 1. And there's really four key, area, uh, key areas to talk about when we're talking about pharmacokinetics. And uh, these are the four areas that I'm going to focus in on for this video and build on some of these concepts, possibly in future videos. So the first thing uh, is absorption. And absorption is really describing how the, bo uh, the patient's body takes in the drug in question. Um, so, for example, um, the drug could be absorbed through the intestines, um, which would be like if we took something orally or even rectally, that would be um, enteral. Or parenteral would be if we had something that was absorbed without the intestines. So if I gave somebody like an IV injection that went directly into the bloodstream, that would be parenteral. Some other examples would be like an inter, uh, I'm sorry, intramuscular injection, a subcutaneous injection. If the drug was inhaled, if it was topical, transdermal, any of that uh, would not be absorbed with the intestines. So that would be parenteral. Now, the bioavailability of a drug is basically how much uh, of the drug um, that's ingested makes it into the systemic bloodstream. Okay, and so depending on how we administer the drug, the bioavailability uh, can be different. So for an IV administration, something that you really want to remember is that the uh, bioavailability uh, will always be 100%. And that, that's really important. But if I uh, were to administer a drug orally, on the other hand, um, not everything that's absorbed um, or not everything that's given orally is going to be absorbed. And so, you know, for example, you might have a tablet that you take. You might have some incomplete tablet breakdown or there might be some barriers to uh, absorption in, across the gut mucosa, um, gastric acid and, and enzymatic dis uh, destruction. You know, pancreatic enzymes or that kind of thing can can absolutely affect um, the ability of um, your oral drugs to have a high bioavailability. Now, um, after absorption through the intestines, this the the really big component of this that you want to remember for oral administration is that um, you have to you have to eventually bypass the liver, and that's something that that we'll talk about um, in a moment. Uh, let me just go back for a second. Okay. And, um, you know, obviously, if you take a drug, you, you absorb it in the intestines, and, and I'll show you this in a minute, and then it'll go through the portal vein to the liver, and that's where we have our first pass metabolism, and that will absolutely decrease your bioavailability. And I'll, like I said, I'll go into more detail on that in a second. Um, okay. All right. Let's go ahead. So distribution, this is where the drug goes after it's absorbed. Okay, so we've absorbed the drug through the um, mucosa. And now we are um, seeing where the drug is going to be headed. Now there's a, a metric that's used to measure the distribution. That's the volume of, dist of distribution, which is essentially the total amount of drug in the body divided by the plasma concentration. So if you were to have a high uh, volume of distribution, you're basically saying that you, you don't have a lot of plasma drug concentration. This would have to be low. When this is low, the VD is going to be high, right? When the plasma drug concentration is high, the VD is going to be lower, right? It's inversely proportional. So the way to kind of think about this, let's, let's say that we had a high volume of distribution. What does that really mean? Okay, well, one concept that you have to kind of ingrain in your brain when you think about this is um, unbound and bound protein. So let's say that um, we had our drug here and it's unbound, and here's some big protein, maybe it's albumin, I don't know, something floating around in the bloodstream. So this, is, this relationship, this drug, um, could bind to our our protein okay so when the drug is unbound this drug can act and it can have its effects right throughout the bloodstream but when the drug is bound now the drug is not acting right it's bound to this protein and so now the plasma drug concentration will decrease okay because this drug is still in the body 
this blue drug when it's bound it's still in the body but it's not part of the plasma drug concentration this is the unbound is the only part of the plasma drug concentration so essentially the VD is telling you how much of your drug is in the unbound form that is essentially acting okay that makes sense so how much of it is bound or unbound you know any way to think about it now some of the drug might not be in the bloodstream at all so it might not be unbound and it might not be bound it could have just left the bloodstream so for example you could have um, very small lipophilic molecules or drugs that can leave the bloodstream and be stored away in fat so that would also cause you to have a high volume of distribution because there might be a lot of drug in the body maybe a lot of it is stored in fat maybe a lot of it is bound which means that a very small amount of that drug will actually be unbound and in the plasma you know performing its action or whatnot okay now um, let's say that you had a more balanced volume of distribution um, then you might have some of the um, drug in the extracellular fluid so maybe some of that drug can go back into the plasma right because there's kind of an equilibrium there so maybe that drug is going into the plasma and maybe some of its in the extracellular fluid where it where it can be accessed if needed if you had a low volume of distribution it's probably the case that all of the drug is in the vascular space because in that case we're pretty much all here we're pretty much all unbound you know not a lot of the drug is in the fat if any and very few of it is probably going to be bound so most of it is all going to be available in the vascular space and that's this plasma drug concentration okay and that's high then the VD is going to be low okay um, one other thing I want to say real quick so the amount of drug bound here can actually be altered um, like if you had let's say that you had like a liver disease okay of some sort that would cause you to produce um, decreased amounts of albumin and albumin being one of the larger the largest protein um, concentration here in the bloodstream would cause less of these drugs to bind to the albumin and um, that would obviously cause you to have more in the unbound form than in the bound form in the case of liver disease okay if that makes sense kidney disease um, can also uh, play a role in this process but I won't go into all of the details here okay um, metabolism uh, this is the third step so we had absorption then we had distribution and now metabolism so this is one of two ways that you can decrease the concentration of the drug okay so we talked about how to get the drug in kind of the distribution of the drug now how do we decrease the concentration of the drug that's either going to be metabolism or we can excrete the drug so now we'll talk about metabolism now the liver is the primary site for the metabolism of drugs so this is where the first pass metabolism will occur okay remember this is when this is our drug it goes into the intestines um, it's absorbed through the portal vein that goes to the liver and as it goes to the liver it will undergo this first pass metabolism where the drug will be metabolized in a two-step phase okay so that process when it goes to the liver and is absorbed is called biotransformation like I said it has two phases the first phase is mostly an oxidative phase okay now there is some other um, components to this first phase which would include um, like hydrolysis reduction those things can happen too but the big thing is phase one um, is oxidation mostly okay and um, it's mediated by this microsomial cytochrome p450 monooxygenase okay and the most common that you'll probably see is this um, CYP3A4 uh, subtype and that's the one we'll talk about when we talk about inducers and inhibitors and that kind of thing and the goal here um, 
during this process, during this oxidation hydroxylation type step, is we want to increase water solubility. And that will increase our renal excretion of the substance. Okay. Um, now, the other thing in this first phase is we are essentially are going to be reducing bioavailability of the drug. And, and what that means is um, less of the drug will be able to essentially be used to perform its function because we're making these changes to it. It's not, you know, in its, in its um, original form necessarily. Now, that will reduce bioavailability. That's why when you take something orally and you take it in, right, goes to the intestines, goes to the portal vein, goes to the liver, it's going to undergo this metabolism and that's going to decrease the bio bioavailability depending on the drug that you know this can vary but when you give something IV it's not going to go through this process right it's going to go right into the bloodstream okay and so it's not going to have this first pass metabolism now the exception is pro drugs so um, pro drugs are drugs that can be activated when they undergo first pass metabolism so that's the exception not the rule in general, we're going to reduce bioavailability here, but keep in mind there are some drugs that you will see a, an opposite effect occur because we're oxi you know, um, going undergoing oxidation on the drug or because we're hydroxylating it or whatever it might be. Now, older patients typically will um, have decreased phase one biotransformation. And so because of that, you might need to scale down the dose a little bit of whatever you're giving because they will not have as much reduced bioavailability after phase one. So that's something to keep in mind. Phase two, on the other hand, is really um, the conjugation phase. So um, in the conjugation phase, we are adding on um, methyl groups like methylation, um, acetyl groups, acetylation. You could be adding on sulfide groups, um, glucuronide groups. So we'll talk about that. And again, the goal is increase water solubility, increase renal excretion, okay? And most of the time, we're going to be inactivating the drug when we go through phase two. Okay. Now, a couple more things about metabolism. So there are inhibitors of metabolism, and there are inducers of metabolism. So an inducer of metabolism, such as St. John's wort, would essentially cause more biotransformation because you're inducing the metabolism of the drug. So you're increasing the biotransformation. Okay, so keep that in mind. So for example, St. John's wort, like I said, is an inducer of this most common subtype, uh, COP3A4. And just kind of quiz question here. So if you were to induce metabolism, how would that affect bioavailability? And I think I already said it a little bit earlier, but it would decrease bioavailability. So if I induce, this is really important, if I induce metabolism, I will decrease bioavailability. If I were to inhibit metabolism, right, less phase one, less phase two transformations, then I am going to increase bioavailability, right? Because there's more of the drug because I'm inhibiting the metabolism that oxidizes it and conjugates it and does all that okay so grapefruit juice is probably the most commonly um, known or, or at least commonly written about that I've seen inhibitor and that also inhibits our uh, cytochrome 3a4 so st. John's wort is an inducer that will cause decreased bioavailability grapefruit juice is an inhibitor increased bioavailability so if you wanted to increase the effects of a drug, would you give St. John's wort or grapefruit juice? I know you wouldn't probably prescribe either one of these in reality, but, um, but which one of these would um, increase the effects of a drug? And the answer is grapefruit juice because it's an inhibitor of metabolism, so you'll have more of the drug when you take grapefruit juice. So that can also be... Um, dangerous, essentially, if someone drinks a lot of grapefruit juices and is on, um, you know, drugs that are uh, metabolized by that enzyme, CYP3A4. Okay, um, what else? Slow acetylators. So, 
these are just um, a small percent of the population and they will have increased effects from drugs because they have slower phase 2 metabolism okay and remember acetylate acetylation is phase 2 metabolism right so slow acetylators it is phase 2 that is going to cause decreased metabolism and increased drug levels okay so excretion this is where drugs are removed from the body and so glomerular filtration uh, your glomerular filtration rate GFR uh, has a, a big role in this um, if you had um, some kind of renal disease that will cause a decrease in your GFR um, or if the drug was bound right like we showed before it's going to be more difficult for the drug to get um, go through that glomerular filtration to get excreted so if we were trying to excrete a drug we wouldn't want it bound to protein okay now you can also excrete drugs through the stool or feces and um, <clears throat> biliary excretion is an example of this um, bile can be excreted through the stool as we know and um, a big component of that is bilirubin excretion now phase two transformation um, when we talked about conjugation you can see that it, you know your I bill or unconjugated bilirubin and your D bill your conjugated bilirubin now hopefully this maybe uh, makes sense if it didn't already why there's an unconjugated and conjugated and that's because in that second step of phase 2 metabolism we conjugate the bilirubin and so that's where that comes from okay um, <clears throat> and you know bilirubin um, is a product of red blood cell breakdown and um, in this way as we conjugate it we're essentially allowing the bilirubin to be excreted okay now there it is this is probably more on the low yield end but the reaction that causes bilirubin um, to become conjugated is by the enzyme UDP glucuronosyl transferase okay and again this is all on a side note but that enzyme is deficient in patients with Gilbert disease um, or those with Krigler uh, Najjar disease okay as we talk more about that we're getting into a little bit more high yield um, type topic but it's not completely uh, what I want to talk about in this video but that's something to note just if you've been studying that um, just making a connection with that okay now the intestinal surface area is very large okay so that um, some of the bilirubin can be absorbed uh, back into the bloodstream after it's been deconjugated by bacteria so when it's deconjugated we can reabsorb it um, which is the process of enterohepatic cycling so it's going to go through this whole absorption right all the way to excretion all over again the same concept can happen with drugs so um, drugs can reach the bloodstream you know through this process after being conjugated and then they can become unconjugated and be reabsorbed because the surface area of the intestine is so large and you can have this kind of enterohepatic cycling process occur with drugs okay now another form of excretion is active tubular excretion and that's essentially where we have like organic anions and cations that um, can be secreted into the renal tubule remember secreted meaning they're going into the renal tubule to be uh, removed excreted from the body now <clears throat> there are some drugs that can block these transporters uh, probenicide for example or probenicid can block these transporters and um, again making connections what is this used to treat and hopefully you remember that this is used to treat gout okay now also a uh, high dose of aspirin can also block these active tubular secretion transporters that's that's also important um, the passive tubular reabsorption so when 
um, we're absorbing from the tubule back into the bloodstream. Um, this can occur also. Now, let's just say we want to excrete a drug. Okay, we, we don't want the drug to be in our bloodstream any longer. What can we do? Okay, for example, if I overdosed on something, what can I do to excrete the drug rapidly? We can ion trap the drug. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, let's say, for example, that the drug that I need to get rid of, that I overdosed on, is a weak acid. Okay, now this is how I remember it because I'm a chemistry guy, um, but there's plenty of ways you can try and um, keep this straight in your head. But I remember, just from general chemistry, okay, let's say we had a weak acid, and we uh, put a base around, okay? So if I have a weak acid, this is my drug, and I put a, have a base around, the base will take the hydrogen ion, right? And so now I have a conjugate base, which is my drug. That's my drug, A-. minus. And on this side, I get water. Okay, but now the point is my drug now has a negative charge. So guess what? Now because my drug has a negative charge, it's not going to leave the tubule because it can't cross. It can't be passive. Uh, it can't undergo passive tubular reabsorption because charged molecules, if you remember, will not easily cross the membrane. So again, if I have a weak acid drug, okay, that I want to get rid of, if I can treat the urine, uh, if I can, or make the urine more basic, then I can increase the excretion of that drug because I can make it charged. On the flip side, let's say that the drug that I overdosed on, for example, I want to get rid of, is a weak base. Then I can acidify the urine to increase the excretion of that drug. And, and the way to remember this is, let's say this is your drug, and it is a weak base this time. Okay, so weak base has no charge. You can write H plus here if it's easier, or H3O plus. I treat it with some acid. I acidify the urine. The hydrogen ion is now bound to the base, and so now my base has a positive charge, and so now it's not leaving into the bloodstream. Rather, it is excreted in the urine. Okay, so I'm trapping it in the tubule. Now, this is a, a concept that... Um, that is used when you have somebody that has a buildup of ammonia. So um, let's say uh, you have a patient with liver failure, okay? And if you have liver failure, you will have decreased urea cycle activity, right? And because that's where the urea cycle takes place. And um, that will cause you to have toxic ammonia compounds building up. And uh, the a very common symptom you'll see with that is a change in mental status, right? So let's say patient has a liver failure, a change in mental status, and where you know, and the reason for that again is because the ammonia can traverse, it's 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 not charged, right? And H3 is not charged. It can traverse the uh, tubule and the bloodstream, and it can get in to a lot of different places, right? And eventually um, to the brain, potentially, and that's what's causing this change in mental status. So, the treatment for that is you can give a patient lactulose, okay, and that is broken up um, by bacteria in the colon, okay, and that makes lactic acid and acetic acid. Okay, so the lactulose is broken up, and essentially it's going to make us lactic acid and acetic acid in the colon. Now, that acid that you made in the colon is going to be used to acidify the contents in the colon, one of which is the ammonia, okay? And that's going to change the ammonia to ammonium ion, which is NH4+. I don't know how much I wrote about this. I should have put more on about this. I apologize, but um, you can probably look some of this up. But essentially, your ammonia is going to get converted to NH4+. Because you have all this lactic acid and acetic acid now in the colon, from the lactulose okay so now it's nh4 plus guess what it's this guy right here it's trapped and so now the ammonia the nh3 is now nh4 plus is not able to be absorbed instead the ammonium ion is secreted okay and that is uh, a common treatment for patients with hepatic encephalopathy okay and 
you know, obviously that's what we just talked about. So the liver disease uh, would be a cause of that. And like I said, treatment is lactulose. Something to remember. Okay. Now, continuing with this ion trapping. Okay. Let's just apply it for a second. So these are the three drugs you want to remember when you're thinking about, hey, you know, I have a patient that um, overdosed on his, um, you know, cancer medications, methotrexate, for example, or his um, phenobarbital, which is used for epilepsy treatment, um, or aspirin, right? So if you have a patient that has overdosed on one of these things, you want to excrete them from the body. These are all weak acids. And so to do that, what do we have to do? We have to add a base to the urine. So they're trapped in basic environments. So I'm typically going to treat these patients with bicarb. Okay. And that's going to trap the molecule and remove it from the urine. So these are three that you want to remember for weak acids. Weak bases, they're taking an amphetamine, a TCA. Those are weak bases. So then we want to do the opposite. In those cases, we want to trap them and in more acidic environments so we can charge them. And a great compound for that is ammonium chloride. You might be thinking, well, wait, wait, wait a second. That sounds like a base to me, but it's not because it's NH4 plus and Cl minus. So NH4 plus will easily give off that hydrogen in a basic environment, um, such as an overdose with either N amphetamine or TCA. Okay, so that's something that you want to keep in mind. That's um, on the higher yield end, I would say. Okay, question time. So I'm going to give you an easy one. Hopefully it's easy. It's okay if it's not, but hopefully it is. And then I'm going to give you a, a little bit more challenging question. So 10% of Caucasian males have decreased CYP to D6 activity, thus they're not able to have adequate pain relief with codeine administration. What phase of metabolism is defective in these patients? Hopefully you can narrow it down to two. Okay. So pause the video. All right, here it goes. The answer is drum roll phase one, right? Because phase one metabolism is when we're going to be using the microsomial um, cytochrome P450 system. The oxidation, hydroxylation, reductions, whatever, are going to happen in phase one. Phase two is going to be the conjugation process, okay? Okay. A little bit more challenging one now. 26-year-old male suffering from severe MDD has attempted to commit suicide by taking an unknown quantity of over-the-counter drugs in his medicine cabinet. The patient is pyrexic and breathing rapidly. He complains of lightheadedness and a constant ringing in his ears. What is most likely the treatment of choice under the circumstances presented? So we have ammonium chloride, grapefruit juice, St. John's wort, aspirin, and bicarb. So what do you think? So pause the video, think about it, and okay, three, two, one. Okay, before I give you the answer, um, why don't we just go through each of them and talk about what each of these things um, would do essentially. Okay, ammonium chloride. Ammonium chloride, what is that used for? It's used to acidify the urine. Remember that NH4+, plus, if it's around... Uh, a lot of something basic will give up that hydrogen and we can acidify the urine. When would we want to acidify the urine? When would we want to do it? Hopefully you said when we have a TCA or uh, amphetamine overdose is when we would want to use ammonium chloride. Okay, grapefruit juice. What does it do? Inhibitor of CYP3A4, the most common cytochrome enzyme, and it is used to do what? Well, if it inhibits that enzyme, it's going to increase bioavailability of drugs because less is going to get broken down. St. John's wort, what does it do? Induces CYP3A4, right? The opposite of grapefruit juice. What is it used for? It's used to decrease the bioavailability of drugs because I am inducing my cytochrome. So I'm having more metabolism. Okay. Aspirin. What is it do well i think we know what aspirin does um but the, i think the big thing here is why is aspirin even here well it's pretty clear that the patient has um, some 
medication that he took. And if you look at the symptoms, and I was trying to uh, maybe give you a clue here with this option, that the patient is suffering from an aspirin overdose. All of these symptoms, the hyperventilation, the tinnitus, um, lightheadedness, feeling faint, pyrexic, right? All these things, you know, obviously, all these things come together and it's it's kind of pointing towards potentially uh, an overdose with aspirin, okay? Now, if you gave him aspirin, obviously that's not the answer, right? That's, that's gonna make things worse. So you're only left with one thing, bicarb. Now, what does bicarb do? It's gonna make the urine more basic, right? Traps weak acids. What are the weak acids that it traps? Phenobarbital, right? It's epilepsy medication. Methotrexate, methotrexate. What does methotrexate do? It's used to treat um, various forms of cancer, blood, bone, lung, breast, head, neck, all that stuff, or uh, rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis also. Methotrexate also inhibits dihydrofolate reductase. That's something we'll talk about when we talk about biochemistry. And uh, by doing that, it decreases the uh, ability to form your uh, deoxythymine monophosphate, and that's why you can't basically um, make more DNA, and that's why it's used to treat cancer because you don't want the cancer to uh, to continue. To rep- um, you don't want cells to continue to replicate and let the cancer uh, metastasize any further. Okay, so um, I went on a big tangent there. Bicarbonate is used to treat. Uh, or is used to treat overdoses with phenobarbital, methotrexate, and aspirin, right? And this person has probably got an aspirin overdose more than likely. If I was with these five options and I didn't have any other tests or anything else to do, I would probably have to say the answer is bicarb, okay? So review that. Hopefully that helped um, describe some of these uh, more basic concepts in pharmacology. If you like the video, uh, please subscribe and like and uh, there will definitely be more videos to come and thank you for watching